Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I am very pleased to be here on God's Sabbath day, a day to rest from our labor and contemplate the Lord. Um, what comes for evil, if God allows it, it's only for good. That's the only reason God allows things to happen. I just want to share a very brief testimony with you. In my country right now, with 500,000 people population, Corona has just jumped into the country, and they're shutting down everything. So now, like, people have to stay inside of the house. So it's not even like shutting down churches. So people cannot have contact with neighbors or anything like that. But today, for the sermon today, the president of the conference was invited to the popular news channel and gave a whole Sabbath sermon before the whole entire nation. So God is at work, and I believe that same thing that he's trying to do here today and as we continue with this um, Revelation of Jesus Christ seminar. God is good. It doesn't matter what happened. He's going to work mightily, and his work is going to be done anyway. So whatever Satan attempts, God has a way to stand because he is the creator. The creature cannot have power over the creator, and I'm very happy because of that. So with that in mind, we would like to welcome everyone again to the Revelation of Jesus Christ series. As our four speakers continue to take us into this adventure of Bible prophecy. And I believe this is the time to learn more of it. God is wonderful and he has our best in his mind. So we're coming live from Wachita Hills College campus. And the desire, the greatest desire of these speakers is to present Jesus Christ. They want to see people connected with Jesus Christ. And we can never have too much of Jesus. Just like yesterday's food is not good for today, so what we learn from Jesus yesterday is not good for today. We have to have fresh revelation. And I believe that's why God continue to have a way that his people may come together. Our speaker for today is Mark Candy. Termidor. He comes from Naples, Florida, and he is training also to become a gospel, uh, pastor, for gospel pastoral ministry, ministry. And after many years running from God, he has found a loving Savior in Jesus Christ. And I believe all of, those, all of us here can say a great amen because of that. Because at a certain point, whether grow as a seven Adventist or not, we were running from God. Just like you know, man's of the past, and here we learn about another person, but God seems to reach our minds and reach our hearts in a way that is so personal. He is here today to do the same thing for us that are local and for those who are watching online. But before the message entitled Prince of Pride versus the High King of Humility, we have an amazing song coming from Fernando and Emily Martins. As you listen to the song, prepare your heart for the message. The Lord is willing to speak. And remember, that which comes for evil, God only allows if it will do good. Blessings. The king of humility is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And um, uh, Hebrews 11, 1 in the English Standard Version says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And our assurance is Jesus is ours and we're gonna be like him one day, amen.
Good morning, everybody. Were you all blessed by the special music that we just heard just now? Amen. Amen. Hopefully one of these days I'll be able to play like that. (laughs) Well, this series, I hope to everyone, has been a blessing. It's been a blessing to me listening to my brothers Maboshe and Joshua and Jace just talk about Jesus Christ. And we're going to continue in the uplifting of Jesus Christ, I hope and pray today. Amen? Amen. So what I would like is for every single one of you is just to pray for me and to pray for yourselves as well as we just look at Jesus Christ, but also as well what we will be looking at Okay. The Prince of Pride versus the King of Humility. And I invite everyone, please, just to pray with me as we open up this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this morning. And Father, Lord, this is your hour. Father, I have no desire to speak. I am but a worm and not a man, Father, but you are the highly exalted one, our creator. And I ask of you, Father, please hide me behind your cross, Lord. Heavenly Father, fill this place with your Holy Spirit and your holy angels to keep back the evil forces that would wish to distract. I thank you so much, Father, for all that you have done, all that you are doing now, Father, and all that you will do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. So this right here is just a testimony. In Matthew 7, verse 7, he says, Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. And I've been seeking and seeking and seeking. Before they call, he will answer. While they are yet speaking, he will hear. Oh, I'm praising God for this right here. I felt like I was David going into battle without my own armor, but I'm praising God. Praise the Lord. Okay, so, all right. So I want to start off with this. You know, we have questions that often we have to deal with each and every single day. Small questions and large questions. And isn't it interesting that a simple question can change the course of one's life? For example, will you marry me? (laughs) Now that obviously is a question that changes a person's life. Now another question that people may hear, it may not necessarily change their course of life, But nevertheless, at the hearing of it, it may give a certain reaction. For example, do you know how fast you were going? Now, I've never heard that question. Well, no, I haven't heard that question. But by God's grace, I don't have to hear that ever again. But there is one question that Jesus Christ asked that has eternal consequences for each and every single one of us. Let's read it in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. And when you guys get there, please give me a wonderful amen. Matthew 16, verses 13 and 14. And so in this situation, Jesus Christ is speaking to his disciples, and he has a very important question that he wants to ask them. And it says this, beginning with verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man is? Or who the Son of Man am? Verse 14, and they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But here comes the most important question for each and every single one of us. 
Verse 15. Who do you say that I am? And the answer that we give to this question will affect our spiritual walk each and every single day. You know, many of us go through various trials and tribulations, and we're wondering, why am I going through this? But Jesus Christ is softly asking this question to us. Who do you say that I am? When you're going through the trials, Christ is wondering, what are you saying about him? When we see wars, when we see crime, and when we see pestilences sweeping the land, Jesus Christ is asking, but who do you say that I am? When we see um, natural disasters striking, and when we see the coronavirus altering our lives, Jesus Christ is asking each and every single one of us, but who do you say that I am? When we lose our jobs, when we're struggling, when it comes to school, when our families are being attacked and breaking up, Jesus Christ is speaking to our hearts and asking the question, who do you say that I am? You know, this world is filled with so much misery and heartache, and many people turn away from God, even once faithful Christians, because they gave a wrong answer to that question right there. And you know, myself, I used to be an atheist, and I had the desire to write many books disproving Christianity, showing that God does not exist, and that God is not someone worthy of our worship. And it all stems from a misapprehension of this question and an answer to it. And so today, what we're going to be doing is looking at this right here, the character of God. Who is he? Who is he to us? And how we can show that to all those around us. And so as we begin, before we start off with that, however, because there's so much sin and suffering in this world, what we want to look at first is simply the origin of evil and sin and suffering. So the first question is this. With whom did sin originate? And the Bible tells us the devil has sinned from when? The beginning. So sin originated with the devil. But then it begs this question. If sin originated with the devil, did God create the devil? And this is a very important question because if God created the devil and sin began with the devil, then who is responsible for sin? God, right? But let's look at this, though. Did God create the devil? And so the Bible tells us, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till what? Until iniquity or sin was found in thee. And so this angel that God created had no taint of sin. He was perfect in all of his ways, but somehow, some way, mysteriously, iniquity or sin was found in him. Now, the next question is this. What was the name of this rebellious prince in heaven? And right here in Isaiah 14, verse 12, we are told, How art thou fallen from heaven who? Lucifer, son of the morning, and the Greek word is, he, no, not Greek, Hebrew word is halel, meaning light bearer or son of the morning. And so God created a perfect angelic being by the name of Lucifer. And yet somehow, some way, he fell. So the question is this, what led to the fall of the angel once known as Lucifer? Well, the Bible tells us this. What, what goeth before destruction? Pride. Pride goeth before destruction, and a what? 
a haughty spirit before a fall or an uplifted spirit. Somehow, some way, Lucifer, who was perfect, had pride in his heart, had an uplifted spirit, and that led him to fall and to rebel. And so now the next question is this. How did pride develop in Lucifer? How is it that an angel that was so perfect, that was in the presence of God himself, the creator of the universe, you know, if I think about it, if I can have that privilege, I don't see, well, it, it, it doesn't make sense that pride could develop that way. But let's see it, though. Thine heart was lifted up because of what? Thy beauty. Thou, was, thou hast corrupted thy what? Wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So Lucifer was a beautiful angel, and he was very intelligent. He had wisdom. And because of these things, somehow, some way, pride lifted up. And what was the desire of Lucifer? We see the leading of his pride. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will do what? I will exalt my throne where? Above the stars of God, and I will be what? Like the Most High. Lucifer, seeing his talents, seeing his beauty, seeing his intelligence, started thinking of himself, you know what? All of these angelic hosts, angelic beings, you know, they see me, they see my talents. Look at me. I am doing so well. You know what? I could do more. And this right here is a warning to each and every single one of us today. You know, every blessing that we have, every talent that is in our possession, is it ours? Where did it come from? God. Lucifer himself forgot this very fact. He thought that he in and of himself was something worthy because of all of these talents. And when we forget who created us, when we forget who blessed us with our beauty, with our intelligence, or with our finances, whatever it may be, then the inevitable result is pride arising in our hearts. And so then the next question is this. What became of Lucifer's pride? And let's see here. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs 13, verse 10, only by pride cometh what? Contention. Every root of sin is rooted in pride, and contention often comes as a result, whether it's open contention or whether it's contention in our hearts, only by pride cometh contention. And so because of this contention, what happened? Let's read this. And there was what? War. War. Where? In heaven, a perfect, peaceful place. War was found in heaven. And Michael and his angels did what? Fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Well, right now, let's go real quickly and just look at the word war. In the Greek, the word is polemos. And as you see the definition right here, one of them is a war. Another one is a fight or a battle. But let's look at the third definition. We have here a what? A dispute or a strife or a quarrel. And from the word polemos, we get this word over here, polemic or polemics. And it tells us this, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, a polemic is a strong what? Verbal attack on someone or something, or polemics is the art or practice of engaging into a what? Controversial debate or dispute. And so when the Bible tells us that war broke out in heaven, based on this definition, what kind of a war was it? It was a verbal war. The devil was going around making arguments against God, 
pleading his cause, saying why God has been mistreating him or all of the angels, why God is undeserving of worship and of rulership. And so then as a result of that, Lucifer, the angel once known as Lucifer, becomes the devil and Satan. And according to the Greek, the devil is what? A what? A slanderer and a false accuser. That is very important, a false accuser. And the Satan is an adversary. So Lucifer, because of his pride, because of his discontentedness, became a slanderer and a false accuser and an adversary. And the Bible tells us that the adversary is after us each and every single day. And so, how extensive was the rebellion? Well, the Bible tells us this. And his tail, that is the dragon, drew what? The third part of the stars of heaven. And if you just note Job 38, verse 7, you'll see that stars are representative of angels. And so the discontentedness of the angel, once known as Lucifer, who became the devil and Satan, affected up to a third of all of the angelic beings. And as a result of this, the ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. And this just goes back to the previous verse, showing us that he deceived the angels through what? Lies. The lies that he was telling, the lies that he was spreading. And with the angels, the question was basically this. Who do you say that I am? And the angels listened to Lucifer, and as a result, he fell, and they fell, and this is the result. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so the devil began rebellion in heaven, speaking against the character of God, him and his angels who listened to his lies were all cast down into the earth. And so the war that began in heaven came down into the earth. And as a result of that, sin came into this earth because the devil began to spread the same lies to Adam and Eve. And so how did Satan, let's look at it specifically, how Satan led Adam and Eve to fall. Let's go real quickly to Genesis chapter 3. And we'll read verses 1, 4, and 7. And when you get there, please say amen. All right. And so the word of God says this. Now the serpent was more what? subtle or craftier than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now what is the devil doing when he's asking this question? What is he insinuating? He's insinuating doubt. He's insinuating doubt. And you know, doubt, especially when it comes to God, is a very serious thing. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us that without faith, what? It's impossible to please him. And so we must believe and trust God. And so with Adam, with Eve here in this situation, the devil is insinuating doubt. Let's go down to verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. In other words, God is a liar. Verse 5, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, 
God is not only a liar, but God is hiding something from you, Eve, from you, Adam, from me, from you. And so as a result of this, we see in verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she did what? She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. In other words, the question was asked by Jesus Christ in a sense, but who do you say that I am, Eve? Who do you say that I am, Adam? And their answer to that question was, you're a liar. I can't trust you. I'm going to listen to the serpent. And they fell. And what was the end result? Let's go to verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were what? Naked, and they sewed fig leaks together and made themselves aprons. I just want to read one last verse, verse 8. And they heard what? The voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife did what? Hid himself. Now, here you have the great creator of heaven. Why would you hide yourself from God after you sin? Think about it in, in terms of the question, but who do you say that I am? Why would you hide? You hide because you don't trust him. You believe that because you sinned that he is going to kill you and zap you right then and there. And if you look at it, the history of many world religions the basis of it is appeasing a vengeful God. You have so many religions that have human sacrifices, acts of self-torture to be able to appease a God whom they saw as vengeful. But as we're going to see today, God is not vengeful, but he is a loving God. And so sin began with Adam and Eve, and it continued throughout the whole world, and we see that Satan deceived the whole entire world. And God, the God of heaven, is seeing all of this. He saw how all we like sheep have what? Gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. And so he took it upon himself rather than destroy each and every single one of us, that he himself would come here and he would live a life of perfection and humility and die for our sins. And so when the fullness of time was come, God did what? Sent his son. And so we're going to be looking at the humility of Jesus Christ, but really, before we can look at his humility, we must first see how exalted a character God was. The exalted position of Jesus Christ in heaven. So Jesus Christ was God when he was in heaven. He was also our what? Creator. And he was a king in heaven. Not only that, he was rich. The Bible talks about how he owns the gold and the silver. In Psalms 50, he has a, a cattle on how many hills? A thousand hills. And in the same chapter, he tells us that the world is his. Not only that, he received the adoration, Jesus Christ, of all of the angels. And yet, after sin, he made the decision, you know what? I love my people. They are hopelessly lost without me. I'm not going to just sit here and enjoy the fruits of my creation and all of the um, adoration of the universe apart from them. I am going to go down there. I'm going to 
lower myself and become one of them. Because really, God is so high, but in comparison to him, we are so low. And it tells us here, who, Jesus, who being in the form of what? God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but what did he do? But made himself of what? No reputation. Now, Lucifer, he was seeking for reputation, but Jesus Christ, who had the greatest reputation, made of himself no reputation, and he took upon him the form of a what? Servant. Now, how often do you see kings or presidents or emperors becoming servants? They're usually seeking to be served. And was made in the likeness of men. And next it tells us, and being found in the fashion as a man. What did he do? Jesus Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. You know, the devil made accusations against God that he was, you know, not worthy of worship, that he was putting himself above everybody else, and he wants to just rule and control. But Jesus Christ was willing to forsake all of that to become one of us, God with us, to be with us, that we might be saved. And so next, we see that he humbled himself, but how exactly did Jesus Christ humble himself? And we'll just see a few examples of it. Although Jesus Christ was God, what did he do? He became man, and he was tempted in all points such as we are, yet without sin. He was made a little lower than the angels. Jesus was also subjected to the rule of imperfect parents. Now consider this. You have a perfect being who created humans, and, yet, and he knows everything, and yet he is willing to subject his authority to them for a time. Not only that, he lived a life of poverty. He grew up in a rough, tough neighborhood. He, was a, um, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted. Jesus Christ experienced every temptation that we have to deal with. And he was a homeless man. But not only that, Jesus Christ went through all of these things for you and I. He suffered all of these things. But even as he was ministering, his life was centered on ministering to other people. At times, he gave up rest so that he could intercede or that he could heal others. Many times, for example, Jesus Christ would be healing people all day, and he would be seeking to spend time alone and just to get away from a while but then there'd be a press of people looking for him, and in self-sacrifice, he would continue healing them. And you know, that's a lesson for each and every single one of us today. No matter what, Jesus Christ will never turn us away. You know, all we have to do is just simply turn to him. But you know, the devil, what the devil does is this, he causes us to doubt. You know, no, I'm not gonna bother Jesus. He's so busy ruling the universe, and he's so busy, you know, saving souls. The little trials that I go through, he's not going to hear that. And, you know, for me personally, this right here is proof that Jesus Christ listens to the smallest prayers. We can come to him with the smallest cares. I was praying, God, please help me to find the Bible. But not only that, I said to God, God, I know that you will find it, so I thank you for finding it, and I'm so grateful for that. So we can always come to him. But not only that, he refused every opportunity to be installed a king. 
the Jews at the time were looking for a conquering king. And they saw the power that he displayed in healing and resurrecting individuals. And they were at times seeking to force him to be king before the time he wanted to be. But you know, as Jesus Christ was ministering and preaching the gospel, he often had to deal with verbal abuse at one point being called a devil. He had to deal with his enemies plotting to kill him at every opportunity. And yet he ministered even to his accusers. He went and sat with them and ate at their homes and preached the gospel to them. Amen? And that just shows you just how much Jesus Christ is serious about the salvation of each and every single soul. And so the question again is, but who do you say that I am? And so we looked at the exaltation of Jesus Christ, his high position in heaven. We looked at the life of humility that Jesus Christ himself had. But you know, there's one situation where Jesus Christ especially showed his humility. Jesus Christ lived a life of ministering to each and every single soul, laboring for the salvation of each and every single one of us. And there came a point in time in his life where the reason why he came was near and the weight of sin was falling upon his shoulders and he came into the garden, his secret place. And we all should have a place that we go to where we meet Jesus Christ, amen? Jesus Christ was in the garden speaking and praying to his father and asking, if it is possible, Father, take this cup away from me. And the Bible tells us, Jesus Christ, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became what? The author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And Hebrews 12, verse 2 tells us, looking unto Jesus, the what? Author and the what? finisher of our salvation, who for the what joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And what was that joy? What was it when Jesus Christ was in the garden, sweating drops of blood, feeling the weight of all of our sins and ready, if God were willing to give up? What was it that allowed him to press forward with the calling that was upon his life? The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 15 that there's more joy where? In heaven for one sinner that repents than of 99 just persons that needeth no repentance. And so Jesus Christ, he saw you and me being saved by his sacrifice, and he made the decision that he would go forward. And so Jesus Christ made that decision. He got up, and his betrayer came, kissed him on the cheeks. And Peter, remember that question that Jesus Christ asked him in Matthew 16, verse 15, but who do you say that I am? How did Peter respond? Well, he responded, you are Christ, the Son of God. But then Jesus Christ was betrayed 
the, 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 the followers of Jesus Christ scattered and fled. And Jesus Christ had another opportunity to give an answer to this question. Oh, where is it at? Okay, well, I don't have it up there. Jesus, Peter, had an opportunity to give an answer to the question, but who do you say that I am? But what did he do? He denied Jesus Christ. And isn't it interesting that when we go through difficulties and when we go through trials, how easy it is for us to deny Christ. When things are well, we're able to say, Jesus, you are the living God. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. When things are going well, but God especially asked the question, Jesus especially asked the question, who do you say that I am when we're going through difficulties and we're going through trials? And so Jesus Christ went through his trials, went through cruel mockings and scourgings and beatings, and he ultimately came upon the cross. And they were taunting him, telling Jesus, save yourself. Get down from this cross. But he could not. He would not. Why? Because he loves you. And because he loves me. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. And you know something? This is what's, what is very interesting to me. How many people have ever been around somebody that was dying? That was about to die? I have. And are they usually able to speak very loudly? No, they usually speak with a soft voice if they do it all. And yet Jesus Christ, when he had what? Cried again with what? A loud voice. What did he do? Yielded up the ghost. This tells us that Jesus Christ was still in the strength of his manhood and he could have gotten off the cross. He could have left but he did it because he loves each and every single one of us.
Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are what? healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And on the cross we see how Jesus Christ gave the greatest example of his humility. But did you know that his humility did not end at the cross. The Bible tells us in Revelation 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand where? Where? And he is doing what? Knocking, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will do what? Come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. Jesus Christ today, right now, is knocking on the doors of each and every single one of our hearts. And he wants to come in. He wants to commune with us. The Bible tells us that he says, learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. And when we do this, when we learn of his character, of his humility, the Bible tells us in the next verse, this will happen. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me where? On my throne. Now think about this. The devil himself, Lucifer, through his pride, rebelled against heaven. And where did he want to be? on the throne of God, and yet he could not reach there because of his pride. And yet Jesus Christ gives each and every single one of us an invitation to come upon his throne, to share his throne with him. Now what kind of humility is that? That the God of the universe will allow us to share his throne, a throne that we are unworthy of, and yet all he is asking us is simply to overcome. Now, how do we overcome? We overcome by the blood of the lamb, yes. And what else? By the word of their testimony. Now, what's the testimony? It's the testimony to this question. Who do you say that I am? Because whenever we give a testimony, what are we doing? We're testifying about who God is, about who Jesus is. 
And so who is Jesus to you? Is he just a creator? Is he just some guy that lived 2,000 years ago? Or is he your personal savior? Is he your friend? Jesus Christ himself says that he calls us no longer servants, but what? Friends. And so I have a simple appeal to each and every single one of us today. Are you willing to open the door of your heart when Jesus is knocking? Are you willing to commune with him, to spend time with him and studying your word and worship and prayer, allowing God to share himself with you? Is anybody willing? Are you willing to allow Jesus Christ to direct your life? Amen. Well, can you kneel with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much that somehow, some way, through this pile of dust, Lord, that you were able to speak this morning. And Lord, I beg of you that you would forgive us. Forgive me, Father, that when you ask us the question, who do you say that I am, that we reply with doubt and not trusting you. But Father Lord, we're making a, a resolve this morning. We're making a commitment, Father, and we're receiving your invitation to learn of you, to trust you, to allow you, the king of humility, to be the king of our lives. And we will not listen to the lies of the enemy. We thank you so much, Father, for all that you have done. Forgive us where we have fallen short. Bless us today. And Father, Lord, I pray be with uh, Maboshe and Joshua as they continue and speaking more of your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Announce the fact that the next meeting is at five o'clock. Uh, Maboshe will be speaking on the gospel and how we can be saved. I don't remember the title, but please come back, five o'clock. We are so pleased that you could join us for this special event here at Wachita Hills Academy and College. If you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, you can go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support making programs such as these, you can find donation information in the description below. Thank you so much again for joining us, and may God richly bless you.